in his 2014 documentary film, Do I Sound Gay?, director David Thorpe examines the stereotypes surrounding the speech patterns of gay men, investigating what it means to have a gay voice or to sound gay. While the vocal stereotypes explored in the film seem to be a fixture in popular culture, they remain a subject for derision and a trigger for bullying and harassment, often causing gay men to internalize homophobia and resort to hyper-masculine sonic expressions of their own identity. These vocal stereotypes and other sonic markers of male homosexuality are often exploited in the oral representation of LGBTQIA characters in video games, where sometimes cliched and or hackneyed voice acting, sound effects, and stereotypically gay music serve as sonic shorthand for the gay community. In this paper, I consider the presence or absence of these vocal and musical stereotypes and tropes in video games with overtly gay themes such as Coming Out on Top, Dream Daddy, A Dad Dating Simulator, and various games by experimental game designer Robert Yang, and discuss their value as camp and as a vehicle for positive and political representations of gay men in video games. At the risk of using too much of my allotted time by being unnecessarily pedantic, I do think it is imperative that I be clear about what it is I hope to uncover in this paper, as it is much harder to find something if you don't know what it is you're looking for. Plus, in order to begin a discussion about the representation of sexuality in video games, it is also important to understand that it is difficult to even agree on a single definition of sexuality. Essentialist definitions of sexuality prioritize physicality and external experience over any other possible variables. For example, sexologist Stephen L. Gotch defines sexuality as, quote, the individual capacity to respond to physical experiences which are capable of producing body-centered genital excitation that only subsequently becomes associated with cognitive constructs, either anticipatory for new experiences or reflective of past experiences, independent of ongoing physical experiences. Four aspects of this definition benefit from elaboration. One, sexuality is an individual capacity. Two, sexuality is experiential. 3. Sexuality is body-oriented, and 4. Sexuality is genitally oriented. Not only do such definitions unhelpfully propose that anyone who does not experience physical intercourse, or at least physical urges of a sexual nature, does not have a sexuality, these interpretations are also ableist, suggesting that those who experience paralysis of the lower body and those who experience some developmental disabilities must, by default, be labeled asexual. Working with this definition of sexuality, one would be hard-pressed to find representational examples in video games without focusing exclusively on the visual and sonic cues indicating that in-game characters are engaging in sensual acts on screen. And because this definition regards sexuality as experiential, body-oriented, and genitally-oriented, it would be impossible to know their level of arousal without visual or aural indications of their corporal reactions. Subtle sonic indications of sexuality within a video game would ultimately take a backseat to visual simulations of intercourse and its associated dialogue and sound effects. Furthermore, this definition presumably only applies to human sexuality, and as we all know, the sexuality of real and imagined species is also presented in video game canon, and among all of the various representations of intercourse in video games, relationships between avatars of different species is not rare. As we have come to understand it over the past decades, sex, or the physical and physiological differences between males, females, and those who are intersex, that is, possessing both male and female sex characteristics, is not only a physical construct, but also a social one, manifested as a status assigned to a person at birth based on their sex characteristics, namely their genitalia. We understand this social status assigned to us at birth based on our perceived sex to be our gender which either becomes more and more part of our identity as we mature, becomes rejected by a person if their sex and gender with which they most closely identify are incongruous, or becomes blended to various degrees with other gender identities to match a person's realization of their own identity. Not only do we perform our gender identity, the cognitive and emotional understanding of our sexual orientation is understood through examining a combination of our desires and attractions, behaviors, self-expression, and relationships with others so much so that our sexual orientation identity is often both internalized and viewed externally as a defining feature of our overall identity. 
The American Psychological Association uses the term sexual orientation both to refer to a physical attraction based on gender and an identity based on social ties. Quote, Sexual orientation refers to an enduring pattern of emotional, romantic, and or sexual attractions to men, women, or both sexes. Sexual orientation also refers to a person's sense of identity based on those attractions, related behaviors, and membership in a community of others who share those attractions. Research over several decades has demonstrated that sexual orientation ranges along a continuum from exclusive attraction to the other sex to exclusive attraction to the same sex. It is important to note here that in their definition, the American Psychological Association prioritizes a cisgendered conceptualization of sex by ignoring gender variance in various other sexualities, such as pansexuality, the attraction to all gender identities and expressions, and scoliosexuality, or the attraction to transsexual and genderqueer identities and expressions. The social implications of sexual orientations and the ways in which they can both intersect and stretch beyond sexual relationships are further described by the APA. Quote, As a combination of physical attraction to physical characteristics, emotional attractions, and social connections, sexuality and sexual orientations are better described by their relational qualities rather than physical ones. End quote. So for the sake of whatever time remains, I'll state outright that, although all sexualities represented within video games are valid avenues for research and discussion, and other marginal sexualities certainly deserve as much or more attention by scholars, this particular presentation focuses primarily on representations in video games of homosexual interactions and relationships between cisgender males, or at least those who seem to identify as masculine of center, who are androsexual or androphilic, which is to say, men who are primarily emotionally, sexually, and or romantically attracted to men, males, and or masculinity. And just as a number of internal and external forces shape our sexuality, a similar constellation of relational forces make up the idea and object of what we call a video game. Offering a perspective that accounts for a wider variety of fundamental elements that may comprise a video game, T.L. Taylor writes, quote, Games and their play are constituted by the interrelations between, to name just a few, technological systems and software, including the imagined player embedded in them, the material world, including our bodies at the keyboard, the online space of the game, if any, game genre and its histories, the social worlds that infuse the game and situate us outside of it, the emergent practices of communities, our interior lives, personal histories and aesthetic experiences, institutional structures that shape the game and our activity as players, legal structures, and indeed the broad culture around us within its conceptual frames and tropes. End quote. It is here where my analysis lies, in the conceptual frames and tropes used by game designers, artists, and programmers to represent game men in video games. I will quickly share a few examples of sonic markers that can be read as performative homosexuality or representations of gay men through sound, beginning with quote-unquote gay-sounding voices. In 1994, Rudolf Gaudio became one of the first of many linguists to search for differing pitch properties in the vocal utterances of gay and straight men. He found that although people could correctly identify the sexuality of the speaker, the identification did not correlate with pitch, indicating that a number of other factors such as phonetics, speech patterns, and other vocal qualities also play a role. And such an assumption overlooks variations present in non-English speakers, and even in subgroups of gay English speakers. Furthermore, many gay men often stretch their own voice beyond its physical acoustical qualities and speak lower to meet cultural expectations of what a masculine man is supposed to sound like. Culturally, we are taught to somewhat falsely associate pitch with masculinity or femininity, as many feminine gay men have low voices and many masculine and or straight men have high voices. That said, high voices and falsetto singing are still prominent tropes in the sonic representations of gay men. In The Queen's Throat, Opera, Homosexuality, and the Mystery of Desire, Wayne Kostenbaum admits to having, quote, always feared the falsetto, voice of the boogeyman, voice of the unregenerate fag, voice of horror and loss and castration, floating voice, vanishing voice. With a grimace, I remember freak pop singer Tiny Tim tiptoeing through the tulips with his ukulele, end quote. This, of course, is not true for every listener or singer, and many popular musicians, such as Marvin Gaye, Justin Timberlake, Justin Bieber, and Adam Levine, just to name a few of many, 
sing in falsetto register without appearing to general audiences as either being freakish or feminine. However, as with drag, BDSM, and many other subversive expressions of identity prevalent in the gay community, strategic identities and their public performance or expression have long been important sites of political action and gay liberation, and affected effeminacy and camp are tools to express these identities. Musicologist and media studies scholar Edward Miller writes, quote, In dance music, openly gay singer Sylvester in the 70s and later Jimmy Somerville used the falsetto voice to express not only passion but also political freedom. Their voices exhibited a way of moving beyond restraints and traditional definitions of masculinity. But make no mistake, their voices expressed lust and had nothing to do with tiptoeing through tulips. Instead, their falsetto iterated a kind of affirming cruising on the dance floor. Sylvester sounded mighty real in his falsetto, and Somerville articulated a pride in his identity through his vocal choices. An excellent example of falsetto as feminizing can be found in the theme song of the game Dream Daddy, a Dad Dating Simulator. Inspired by the Tumblr page Dilfs of Disneyland, this narrative game invites players to assume a male avatar and meet other single dads in the neighborhood to which he and his daughter have recently moved. The theme song is composed by electronic musician Will Wiesenfeld, known by his stage name Baths. Notice both the use of electronic dance music genre and falsetto singing in this clip. This song is, of course, tongue-in-cheek, and purposefully sounds both dreamy and cheesy, as if it were a parody of an early 1990s doll commercial. When asked about the creative process, Baths even tweeted that he, quote, couldn't stop laughing and fucked up so many takes, end quote. The lilt of the word daddy at the end of the opening phrase is both provocative and dripping with camp. A similar dating simulator, although admittedly one much more focused on sex, coming out on top, takes the opposite approach, adopting the 1990s queer core band Pansy Division's Love 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 as its theme song, and cashing in on what could be viewed as the hyper-masculine and anti saccharine aesthetics of punk music. This hyper-masculine aesthetic is echoed in the visuals and narrative of the game in which a masculine character uses a dating app to seek out dates and sex at masculine places, such as the gym, football field, wrestling ring, etc., with other masculine characters almost without exception. Unlike Dream Daddy, which allows for a very wide variety of body types and shapes, even notably allowing for trans male avatars, the menu for coming out on top only features one customization option, called Hair and Beards, which allows you to specify which characters have facial and body hair or not. Reminding players that sound is important as they begin to play each of his gay-themed experimental games, Robert Yang places the hyper-masculine representational politics of American gay culture at the forefront of the player's attention, both visually and sonically. The Tea Room, a historical nickname once used by gay men to refer to public restrooms that were used for sex, is set in a highway rest stop in Mansfield, Ohio in 1962 to highlight the injustices perpetrated by local police departments who had set up sting operations to entrap gay men and imprison them under antiquated sodomy laws. As a protest for having his previous games unfairly banned from Twitch, Yang created this cruising simulator, replacing the penises of any male companions with guns, which, for some reason, are more palatable and less offensive to mainstream game designers and publishers. 
In this clip, you will hear God Damn It Bill, performed by the Lonesome Billies, a Vancouver-based band whose sound is reminiscent of the honky-tonk Western roadhouse music of the 1960s and 70s, and in a style similar to Johnny Cash, Hank Williams, and other especially masculine performers of this genre. Yang's Rinse and Repeat is a shower fantasy simulator in which players are asked to wash another man in a public shower. The character being washed is rendered visually and sonically as hypermasculine, with a hairy, muscular body and inexplicably wearing aviator sunglasses into the shower, perhaps to make the encounter more anonymous. Throughout the interaction, this character interjects phrases such as Yo pal, man, work that shit, and fuck yes, with especially a macho inflection. Once the washing is complete, it's rated with phrases such as, that was great guy, you did real good bro, and I love your touch pal, which are especially stilted and almost poorly executed on purpose, as the masculine nickname seemingly added as an unnatural afterthought. The dreamy music that plays during this fantasy simulation is Vivanace by the Toronto-based band Grounders. Taking it slow. I like that. Work that shit. Man. That's the stuff. Dude. Mm. Yeah. Huck, yes. That was great, guy. You did real good, bro. Game scholar James Paul Gee argues that, quote, games recruit identities and encourage identity work and reflection on identities, end quote. And as time progresses, we are finding more and more that the representational politics surrounding various identities in games and the relationship these identities share with game audiences are playing an increasingly larger role in the way players understand and appreciate a game's narrative, mechanics, and reception. And as more scholars in our field undertake research projects investigating the sonic representation of gender and sexuality in video games, deeper and more meaningful analyses of these identities, both inside and outside of video games, will assuredly lead to better understanding. 